Ah, the early to mid 90s. What a time to be alive. What a time to be a comic book collector. You know, a lot of people with rose colored glasses will go back and look on the early to mid 90s and say, What a horrible time. Nothing but crap came from that era. And you know, at some point, they're a little bit right. A lot of crap did come from that era. But let me tell you something. I was lucky enough <clears throat> to be alive during that area and be a collector of comics. To go to my comic book shop every week and grab my pull list during that time. And let me tell you something. What an exciting time that was. That was probably the best time I ever had being a comic book collector. Going in there, <laughs> seeing a million different specialty covers for comics, seeing a whole bunch of new number ones, seeing a whole bunch of publishing companies come out and start publishing comics. And yeah, a lot of crap came. A lot of crap went. But there are some few good gems from the early 90s. As a matter of fact, I, th I would say there was more good stuff than bad stuff in a certain way from the early to mid 90s. If you don't know what happened during the early to mid 90s in the comic book industry, I'll just try to do a little quick synopsis. Basically, many people credit it with the death of Superman, but I'm going to pose a little theory that happened a little bit before the death of Superman storyline. But basically, comic books became popular. The speculation market um, was booming. People thought that comic books were the new get-rich-quick scheme, to be honest with you. And comics were starting to receive an unparalleled level of success. And because of the speculation market, because of movies like Batman, which had come out in 1989, and because of uh, a few initiatives, which we'll get into in a second, pushed by comic book companies, and, of course, the death of Superman, it brought a lot of people, good and bad, to the comic book market. And so the comic book companies, of course, in their lust for the almighty dollar, and you really can't blame them from this because, you know, you see something that makes money, you want to make more, be more successful, started putting out all kinds of crazy stuff. They started having gimmick covers. Hell, even I remember even there was an issue, a comic book issue I had that had a bullet hole cover. Die cut covers, hologram covers, you name it. They started killing off or changing their fundamental mainstream heroes and making a more rad or 90s version, as you could say, of them. Uh, anybody who had ever seemingly appeared in a comic book got their own series or limited series it was just companies were throwing every hero to the wall seeing what stick what was kinda popular and then hey if that way I was popular let's push a series for them. popular heroes were getting spin-offs I mean there was a time where spider-man had five freaking books come out every month and that's not including the kid stuff Companies were appearing out of nowhere to publish comics. At one point in time, you had like Marvel, DC, Image, Valiant, Malibu, Defiant, and several others. Of course, this period of boom would not last, and around 95, 96, it started to collapse upon itself. And a lot of these beloved comics would not survive the purge, as you would, as, as you would say, and fall victims to... Uh, their own success. Uh, comic book companies folded and even Marvel Comics eventually it led to their bankruptcy and having to sell off a lot of their uh, intellectual properties uh, so we would get a bunch of crappy movies from them. Now a lot of people credit this to the Death of Superman storyline but about a year before Marvel did an initiative the heroes of the 90s. More grungier, more grimier, more down to earth, more radical than anything before. Forget that hair metal, wimpy 
goofy hero you knew. We're in the age of grudge, of flannel shirts, and <laughs> um, depression music. And we got to have heroes to represent that. So Marvel basically launched a bunch of new titles like The Punisher, Moon Knight, uh, Ghost Rider, Doctor Strange. They created some new ones like Sleepwalker, Dark Hawk. They brought back people like Deathlock. And <clears throat> they made them more violent, more edgier, and more in your face. With a heavy emphasis on art and not story. See, another thing about the 90s was art was in, story was out. It was the time of the comic book artist. Um, a comic book could have a great story, but if it had crappy art, it wouldn't do well. However, if the art was fantastic, the story could be absolute <laughs> horrid garbage, and the comic book would still sell by gangbusters. Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, you know, Lee Field, um, Eric Larson. Uh, a whole bunch of others. This was their time. Marvel had its fair share of decent artists. They weren't as overrated or propped up as some of the image guys, but they did have their fair share. And the comic book industry, in the long run, suffered during that time but it was during the beginning of this time that the second series of Ghost Rider was created now I happened upon it in 1990 when issue 2 came out I was going down to the grocery store my local grocery store looking at the magazines and I saw issue 2 of Ghost Rider while at that time I wasn't really collecting comics so I immediately picked it up looked at it thought wow all right, my boy's back. Looked good. Immediately went to my local comic book store, got issue number one, put Ghost Rider on a pull list, and there were about 20 other titles I got interested in. Uh, and it became an expensive little hobby. And that was another thing about the 90s. It got expensive, especially if you tried to get all the gimmick covers and all the ones and stuff like that. Because <clears throat> a comic book store could get an issue one, and this happened with the death of Superman a lot, really. But a lot of other issues, or, or gimmick covers, sell out, and then, you know, <laughs> have some more waiting in the wings, and then right, jack up the price significantly. I mean, there were comic book magazines specifically made with price guides in there try to keep track of the current rising and falling prices of your favorite comic books. That goes to show you how big of a boom the industry was. But Ghost Rider Series 2 came about in all this. And Ghost Rider Series 2 began in 1990 and lasted 93 issues till 1998. It had several spin-offs, uh, several graphic novels, and even at one point in time created its own little corner of the Marvel Universe with a horror type brand that spread other uh, spin-off titles. <clears throat> Ghost Rider hit the ground running with gangbuster style. From the get-go it was a very popular book. He was popping up in everybody else's book and he even got his own toy line eventually. So unlike the first series which ended really strong but always had started slow and had to build momentum. The second series of Ghost Rider hit the ground running and was immediately one of the Marvel Comics most popular titles for the next couple years. The series benefited really from having two writers during its whole 93 issue run. Howard Mackey would start the title and go on uh, I think to about issue 60 something and then leave the book and then it would be taken over by Ivan Valdez Jr. until its final issue uh, in 1998. 
uh, with a with a guest rider every now and then peering up. So there was some stability on riders. However, there was very little stability in the art department. And when art was the big thing, art can kill or make a book. And Ghost Rider, uh, luckily, when it started off, started off strong with some fabulous art, fabulous story. It was a damn good book when it started out. However, it became a victim of its own success. And if you had to sum up the 1990s Series 2 Ghost Rider, that's the best way to put it. It became a victim of its own success and a the success of the comic book industry in whole at that time. Basically, the story revolves around a man named Danny Ketch. Danny Ketch is a I don't know, 19, 20 year old guy out of school, not in college, has a menial job with a delivery service, lives with his mother, Francis Ketch, and his sister Barbara Ketch. Their father died when his father died when he was young. He has a girlfriend named Stacy Dolan, who's training to be a police officer because her father is Captain Dolan of the police precinct where he lives at. And he lives in uh, Cypress Hills, New York. It's an area of New York. His, he has a buddy, his best friend is Jack, and that's his life. On one Halloween night, his sister kind of forces him to go out to a graveyard to go film Houdini's grave. For a Halloween type fun activity. Now his sister is very strong willed and pushy. She's older than him. However Danny is kind of a wimp. He scares easily. He's just not an adventurous type person. It just so happens that that night there happens to be a gang skirmish between Wilson Fist who's the kingpin of New York, his men and a new villain by the name of Death Watch and his men after some kind of canisters the kids get caught caught up in the crossfire and Barbara gets basically almost mortally wounded with an arrow going through her chest Danny panics <clears throat> and is trying to get to safety and carrying her around with him and they stumble into an old junkyard and he starts to hide and while in the junkyard he finds a old motorcycle and the gas cap begins to glow he touches the gas cap uh, gas cap he has blood on his barber's bloods on his hands from tending to her and foosh he is transformed into the ghost rider and he beats the thugs and gets barbara to safety of the hospital and that is basically the introduction and first issue of our ghost rider whether this Ghost Rider is a Rathos is the big mystery of the book. You don't know. And that is one of the things that makes this book so damn good in the beginning. As you can see, his motorcycle is a little different. It's really flaming wheels, but it can ride up walls and stuff like that. This Ghost Rider is impervious to bullets and a lot of other physical damage. Um, however, he cannot shoot Hellfire. He has his chain which he can detach and use and he can also throw it and the links will come out and hurt people with the links and it'll come back together again he has something called the penance stare and this is when he gazes into the eyes of his foe or opponent and they see all the evil and wrong they have ever done to anybody else and they feel that evil and wrong that they've ever done to anybody else and it usually makes people turn into uh, jelly. I mean, they just their lives are changed forever after. It's a lot like the Hellfire Johnny Blaze used to soul people, uh, fry people's souls with. He has no idea who he is. He's not Dan Ketch. Dan Ketch uh, is not in control of him. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dan Ketch really has very few memories of when the Ghost Rider is out and about. He rarely has any few memories of what the Ghost Rider is actually doing. The Ghost Rider itself does not know who he is. He just knows that he is the spirit of vengeance and is there to wrong the right. 
Uh, he has a vow that he will not kill humans. Uh, but that doesn't stop him from killing non-human type stuff. He, <clears throat> um, Danny can only turn into the Ghost Rider when he touches the gas cap of the motorcycle. Now the motorcycle transforms from Ghost Riders to back to its old regular bike, but it runs when uh, it's not in use. And when Danny touches the gas cap of the motorcycle, he can turn into the Ghost Rider. But this only happens when at nighttime, and this only happens when danger or evil is nearby in the beginning of the series. Later on, that would evolve, but for now, in the beginning of the series, that is basically the gist of Ghost Rider's powers. Now, the first, we're going to go over the first two years of this series, issues 1 through 24, uh, and the graphic novel Heart of Darkness. You're going to see guest appearances by several superheroes, The Punisher, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, X-Factor, uh, and Wolverine. Uh, Howard Mackey, when he came, wrote the series, he made an intentional decision to make the Ghost Rider more of a street-level type hero and tried to keep the supernatural stuff to a minimum. He wanted it to go against archetypes. He wanted Ghost Rider to fight regular villains and team up with street stuff. He wanted to keep the supernatural to a minimum, and it worked. <clears throat> um, but also, you're going to see a lot of things from the last series, and that is one of the th another good thing about this series that I have to praise is the continuity between it and the first series. Howard Mackey obviously had read the first series and knew what was going on. Unlike some other comic book writers who come in have no clue about their characters that their writings passed and just start writing up a whole bunch of new garbage. Howard Mackey knew the backstory of Ghost Rider. So a lot of stuff fits. <clears throat> um, you're going to see Ghost Rider take on new villains, but you're going to also see him take on some established villains in the Marvel Universe. Uh, you're going to see uh, the mystery progress a little bit and leave little clues here or there as to who or what the Ghost Rider is and you're gonna see the Ghost Rider evolve a little bit over the first two years and Danny Ketch evolve a little bit over the first two years. Um, in my opinion this is the best run of Howard Mackey's for this series. The first two years are the best in the entire series three of Ghost Rider. It's not to say that other parts of this series are downright awful, although some of them are. But this is the strongest and best part of this series. Eventually this series would become, a, like I said earlier, a victim of its own success and become bloated and Howard Mackey would be stretched thin. He's writing like three different comic books at one time and the writing will start lacking and you eventually lose the mystery of who the Ghost Rider is and the book just doesn't isn't as strong and then when Valdez takes over he just completely ruins the book um, if I were a Ghost Rider fan which I am and was recommending a cheap way to get into the series I would recommend getting the first two years worth issues 1 through 24 of the second series of Ghost Rider it is fantastic it's not flawless it does have a few problems but damn is it some damn good storytelling damn good action and it is damn near flawless and speaking of flawless the art Ghost Rider for the first two years was really lucky and that it had terrific artists working for it. Javier Salteres was the artist from issues 1 through 6, 8 through 10, and issue 12. 
his art is a cinematic clean style with dark undertones like that cover right there that you're looking at and the art was fantastic it fit the book he was inked by Mark Texteria or Tex Texeria I'm not sure how you pronounce it I'm sorry if I don't and when Sinta when Salters would leave the book Mark would take over penciling form and Mark would pencil issue 7 13 through 19 and 22 through 24 his style is very much different from Javier as you can see by that cover right there that glow in the dark cover that was the first gimmick cover <laughs> for this series but as you can see right there that is Texas art and his art is fantastic I even like it a little bit better than Salter's I really do it's gritty it fits the tone real good and there are two people in this world that were born to draw a Ghost Rider and these two people are the best Ghost Rider artist in all the series and the series almost suffers for when both these artists leave and that is Salter's and Tex nobody draws Ghost Rider like them as a matter of fact they are so prolific Tex would and Salter's would be called back in another Ghost Rider series uh, to draw the Ghost Rider because their art fits it so well it's not to take anything away from any of the other artists who did a good job on this book but however it's like those two guys were made to draw the book when they're together or separate no, that no other artist can draw a Ghost Rider like they can nothing beats them and because the art was so strong, because the story was so strong, that is why the first two years were so successful. That is why they're some of the best Ghost Rider storytelling, basically, of all time. You can debate whether these first two years are the best Ghost Rider has ever and will ever be, or those first two years. Now, Larry Stroman would guest fill, uh, fill in uh, guest art on issue 11, and his art is not bad. And Ron Wagner would guest fill in on issues 20 through 21. Ron Wagner is also a very good artist. He would later go on and take over after Tex leaves for a couple issues. And then he would later go on to do the spin-off series Morbius, The Living Vampire. His art is very good and it fits the tone of Ghost Rider. And he did a wonderful job on Morbius. And if you look at that book, Morbius, when Wagner left that book, that book was, that's when that book really started to go downhill. I uh, usually, you, you when an artist leaves, the story's still good, it's all right. But at, like I said, this was the time of artists, and if you had a terrible artist that take over a book, man, that spelled death for it. And when Rag Wagner left, no matter what, that that book started going downhill. <clears throat> As for villains, we get a whole plethora <laughs> of new and established villains. Mr. Hyde, Flag Smasher, Scarecrow, Nightmare, Hobgoblin, and of course Mephisto makes an appearance, and so does the Kingpin for this first two year run. But it's the new villains that really set the, the tone for this series. And mainly two villains in particular death watch and blackout now blackout was featured in the second ghost rider movie and he would become arguably the most popular and most used ghost rider villain of them all um he's not my favorite but he's he's pretty good death watch would be ghost riders main nemesis or big nemesis, big boss. While Blackout was Ghost Rider, you know, fought him more and became his main nemesis. Death Watch was the big boss nemesis. And uh, another thing about this two years is a lot of storylines wrap up at the end of issue 24, as you can see when we go over the books. Um, and so you get kind of almost like a fresh start, a fresh clean start after issue 24 and it becomes like another jump on point for the book 
Um, which I like that. I like that a lot of the storylines were wrapped up after the first two years. And it was to make way for something else, for something bigger that would come along because of the success of Ghost Rider. So issue one, I already told you what happened with issue one. Issue two is, and issue three are the first, issue one, two, and three are the first story arc, the thing between the Kingpin, Death Watch, and the canisters. Basically, there are these canisters that will release this neurotoxin upon uh, New York and kill a whole bunch of people. And Death Watch, you get the feeling that he's not really human. It's implied that he's not totally human. And he will um, benefit from the suffering of the people. The Kingpin is actually trying to stop Death Watch from doing this. And the Ghost Rider is caught in the middle. And Blackout is Death Watch's main lackey. He has the power to basically dampen light. Whenever he gets near, he dampens light, and he's a little stronger. He's been like mechanically. Uh, he had like <laughs> fake fangs put in his mouth and, and and stuff like that. Death Watch becomes more powerful when somebody dies and he's near him. He like feeds off of that death and therefore he becomes more powerful usually he's killing the people but you know there you go and he's hard to hurt he's not quite human he's a trans lord which we would later on come to find out but never like from another dimension or something like that and blackout is actually a um well we won't get into what he actually is yet we'll save that for later so the first story arc is basically uh barb is in the hospital um, Kingpin and Death Watch's men are trying to track down the last canister that this little gang of kids found and hid in the cemetery in Cypress Hill. Uh, blackouts going around murdering people trying to find the canisters. And um, Ghost Rider is trying to find them as well. Danny's dealing with the dilemma of turning into Ghost Rider. And he's pushing his family aside. And eventually at the end of the three issue story arc Death Watch relents to the Kingpin uh, who over who has like a hundred men show up and Death Watch just leaves. Blackout gets furious at Death Watch for just relenting and has his little ninja group try to kill there's Blackout right there try to kill uh, everybody in their way and he tries to open the canisters and Ghost Rider stops him, and in the process, it defigures Blackout's face. And then he leaves for the time being. And so we kind of have a mini wrap-up. Now, that will be the last you ever see of the Kingpin in Ghost Rider comics. Um, I know, a little weird to introduce him like that, but it won't be the last time you see Death Watch. Issue 4 is sort of a mini break. It's He fights Mr. Hyde. It's basically... He wants to get rid of his bike, wants to get rid of the bike, tries to lock it up somewhere in the city where he won't be around it, stumbles across Mr. Hyde going on a rampage, and Ghost Rider fights Mr. Hyde, and Danny decides, ah, I'll keep the motorcycle close by anyways. Issue 5 and Issue 6 is a two-issue guest appearance with the Punisher, where they first fight each other, and then team up to take down the villain Flag Smasher. Uh, Flag Smasher is a lesser known Marvel villain. Uh, he's an anarchist and just wants to overthrow the government and stuff like that. Issue 7 is one of the most seminal issues in the second series of Ghost Rider and it is the reintroduction of the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow was a D, hell, you could even maybe even say F level Captain American villain who fought Captain America, constantly got his butt whipped by him. And basically, he was just a contortionist. Well, the story starts off that Scarecrow is in an insane asylum, and he gets free, and they Howard Mackey does one of his best jobs ever of portraying somebody with a mental disorder. I mean, the Scarecrow is literally crazy. I mean, and you see how crazy he is, and in a way, you kind of feel bad for him. He gets loose. He starts becoming a serial killer, killing people, in the New York area and then leaving messages and blood for Captain America to come and find him. Ghost Rider finds him first. They get into a fight. Ghost Rider 
doesn't mean to kill him, but Scarecrow kind of supposedly kind of kills himself and dies, but he's not really dead. Somebody at the end comes along and gets the body, and Scarecrow will return. But also, Blackout reappears, and he sneaks into the hospital, and he murders Barbara while she's uh, asleep in her hospital bed. She's, she never came out of the coma. She was in the coma the whole time. And Danny is devastated, and his family's devastated, and this changes Danny in a certain way. It's very, it's a very heart rivet, uh, riveting part moment in the story of Ghost Rider, and it's very powerful. Um, issue eight is the return of Nightmare, and basically Nightmare is trying to figure out, like many people will come to. If this Ghost Rider is the Rathos, and um, we get the seeds of Nightmare basically, and you get a lot of uh, character study in depth between Danny Ketch and the Ghost Rider in this issue. But actually, I'm sorry, Nightmare is not really there yet. You can you can argue that Nightmare is causing this, but you don't know who's causing it at the time. Okay, this is what I'm trying to say. This also starts the beginning of the Morlock storyline, which is probably the weakest part of the whole two-year period. And but it's only these two, really these two couple issues. And it's basically these Morlocks going around kidnapping kids to save them from Mask, who's a mutant. And Ghost Rider basically kind of teams up with X Factor, which is uh, the original X-Men, just in their own group and saving a bunch of kids. Issue 10 introduces a new villain called the Zodiac. Now, the Zodiac is one of my favorite Ghost Rider villains. Um, the way Howard Mackey writes him is crazy. He's like a, a guy who sold his soul to a bunch of demons and has to sacrifice people to the demons. So he uses the serial killer shtick to cover up what he's actually doing. And uh, <laughs> gaining power from it, so he just goes around and and pretend like leaves uh, zodiac signs at the killings and stuff like that. And he's a very charismatic guy. He like takes it with a, like a casual, a whole casual business approach, man. And the way Howard Mackey writes him is great. And Ghost Rider fights him, and uh, you know neither of them really win, and Zodiac escapes. The next issue, Nightmare comes in. And that's where Nightmare basically does the same thing he did in the first series. He tries to give Zarathos his memories back and unleash him upon the world. And Ghost Rider is like, you're, you're, and he tells Ghost Rider Zarathos' origin. But it rings no memories for Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider's like, that, none of that rings any memories for me. I don't think I'm the person you're talking about. I don't think I'm this Rathos. And so him and Nightmare get into a fight and of course he, he beats Nightmare and, and tells him, look, don't ever bother me ever again. So Nightmare doesn't adhere to that. However, you get a major clue that this Ghost Rider is not Zarathos because he reacts totally different to being told in his past. Um, and you learn also a little bit about Danny's past and about his real father or his father what what the deal is with his father um, and you know maybe he's adopted or something like that the next issue features Doctor Strange and Doctor Strange comes and you get a two-parter one is in it, the issue of Ghost Rider and the second part is in the issue of Doctor an issue of Doctor Strange and basically Doctor Strange comes looking to find out because he thinks this is Zarathos too and he kinda comes to the conclusion that this may not be Zarathos and him and Ghost Rider kind of team up. They take down one of Zodiac's uh, facilities. And uh, Ghost Rider helps Doctor Strange with his quest. Um, next is issue 13, the introduction of Snowblind. Now, Snowblind is a super-powered drug dealer. He's in control of a large drug organization. He's in bed with the cops. And he basically has this ability to cause a whiteout field all around him where only he can see. But when he doesn't have that whiteout field, he's blind. He can't see. 
and uh, him and Ghost Rider get into a fight. It kind of leads to a draw. However, Snowblind has uh, one of his dirty cops kill a regular cop and pin it on Ghost Rider. So the police are now manhunting Ghost Rider vigorously. And it, it'll turn out that Snowblind is working for Death Watch. But during this time, we've been getting snippets of somebody heading to New York vowing to stop the Ghost Rider. And we find out it's been Johnny Blaze. Now Johnny Blaze, after the end of the second series, married Roxanne, took over ownership of the Quentin Carnival, and has had two kids, Craig and Emma, and he's lived a happy life. However, once news reports started popping up, that the mysterious Ghost Rider has returned and is in New York, Johnny Blaze started becoming obsessed. He couldn't deal with the fact that Zarathos was out there ruining and destroying other people's lives, and he has to do something to stop it. So he leaves his family, even though he hates doing it, to come and try to stop Ghost Rider. Now, Johnny Blaze has no powers of any kind. He comes with a shotgun and a trench coat. That's basically it. Um, but he is a revamped Johnny Blaze, and Howard Mackey gets Johnny Blaze very right. It Howard Mackey was smart to bring Johnny Blaze back too, because now you have a bridge connecting the first series and the second series. And I remember when Johnny Blaze first showed up, I was so damn happy. Our God, man, I was so excited. I was like, woohoo! All right, Johnny Blaze back. And so, of course, he thanks Danny as Arathos. And so the next two issues are basically a fight between Johnny Blaze and the Ghost Rider. Now, Ghost Rider uh, easily would beat Johnny Blaze. But Ghost Rider touches Johnny Blaze at one point, and Hellfire goes from Ghost Rider's body into Johnny Blaze's shotgun. <clears throat> and then, therefore, from now on, Johnny Blaze has the ability to shoot Hellfire from that shotgun. It's kind of a way of giving him a superpower. And he, that Hellfire can hurt Ghost Rider and does hurt Ghost Rider. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, Ghost Rider is trying to capture Blackout. Blackout's been going around killing anybody Ghost Rider's had in com uh, Danny has had in contact with. That's right. Blackout knows Dan Ketch is the Ghost Rider. He knows Danny's secret identity because he followed him one time and found out about it. So if Danny goes to a hot dog stand and buys a hot dog from the vendor, Blackout later on kills that hot dog vendor. If <laughs> Danny goes and buys a newspaper from a newspaper vendor, Blackout kills that newspaper vendor. And so Blackout's been doing that, and then he's eventually going to tr kill Danny's family. Ghost Rider has been chasing him. Johnny Blaze shows up at the wrong time. They get into a fight. He weakens Ghost Rider very much, and... Uh, eventually helps Ghost Rider take down Blackout. Still not sure if Ghost Rider is Zarathos or not. He says, you don't act like Zarathos, but when I first was Zarathos, Ghost Rider, I didn't act like him either. So, Johnny Blaze sticks around for a couple more issues. It's issue 16 and 17. And he says, tells Danny, look, if, you, if you're not Zarathos, you need to train. We need to train you to learn how to ride a bike really well. We need to train you how to fight. Because whether or not you're Zarathos or not, more people like this black guy, blackout guy are going to pop out of the woodwork and put you and your family in danger. And you got to defend yourself, and you're not going to be able to be Ghost Rider all the time. And so he kind of takes Danny under his wing as a mentor, but he's still willing to kill the Ghost Rider and free Danny from it. Uh, if it turns out Ghost Rider is Zarathos. He's still not 100% sure. Meanwhile, the Hobgoblin, who <clears throat> is one step before becoming the Demigoblin, this is the Hobgoblin that is the demonic Hobgoblin at the time, is going around killing people, <laughs> and Spider-Man is uh, chasing him down. And uh, in an earlier couple issues of Spider-Man, <clears throat> written by the Todd McFarlane, uh, Ghost Rider made an appearance and fought the Hobgoblin in that. So, basically what you have is Spider-Man, 
Ghost Rider, and Johnny Blaze teaming up to take down the Hobgoblin in those two issues. And the Hobgoblin is a lot cooler than than he he was as Jason McGill Hobgoblin. I'm not talking about the original Hobgoblin. I'm talking about the Jason, I believe it's Jason McDell Hobgoblin. He's a lot cooler this way. And um, so you have those three kind of teaming up to stop the Hobgoblin with Spider-Man scared that Ghost Rider is going to kill him. And uh, Ghost Rider, of course, doesn't kill him. Uh, they do beat the Hobgoblin. Meanwhile, while all this has been going on, Dan Ketch's mother, Barbara Ketch, has found religion. She's been going to this new preacher who's promising that he can bring Barbara back to life. And he's this kind of a scam artist. He goes around and he preys on people and I can bring your family member back. I, you know, I can eat your sins. I'm the sin eater and bring your family back. Now, if you were a fan of series two, you kind of know where this is going. And so I was real excited when this came about, too. Well, Dan, of course, is suspicious of the preacher, whose name is Reverend Stidge. And that's what issue 18 is about. He confronts Stidge. And it turns out Stidge is kind of basically, Stidge seals, steals their souls. He gets the people separate, steals their souls. With a little twist, Stidge is a cannibal. He eats them. He saves their party parts for later and feeds on them. So, but he has really not much special powers uh, except for when the souls give him a little bit of strength. And Ghost Rider easily beats him. But the epilogue to that issue was, again, another moment when I got so excited and was just, wow, all right. Woo. Stidge walks in to a like a basement and says please master I'm sorry I failed I blah 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 and the master rips out Stidge's eye and is fixing to kill him though you don't see who the master guy is and he says wait master please I would have would have beat one except for the ghost rider and at that point the master stops what he's doing from killing Stidge it was like ghost rider well you brought back some memories, my Sin Eater. At that point in time, you knew that was Centurious. You knew it had to be Centurious. <clears throat> and at that point in time, you had to start thinking, wait a minute, if Centurious is free from the Soul Crystal, where's the Rathos? And so, it really added... You had to appreciate this comic. You would appreciate this the series more if you were a fan of the first series. You didn't have to be, but it was an added bonus. And... There you go. Um, it brought a lot of excitement. But that would be put on hold for a little bit. Because Mephisto would come along. And Mephisto is also trying to seek the answers to who Ghost Rider really is. you think Mephisto would know. But he's not 100% sure. So, uh, Mephisto creates a guy named Suicide. Suicide is another uh, misstep. One of the few faults of this two-year run to be honest with you he's basically a guy who wants to commit suicide doesn't have the guts to do it makes a deal with the devil that so he can kill himself De the devil gives him the ability to kill himself and the will and bravery to kill himself however suicide now can't can't die the only way he can die is be killed by ghost rider and he's a lot stronger now than he was and he feels good he doesn't feel like dying anymore but the only way he can uh, but he still has that will to die but uh, the only way he can die is by Ghost Rider. And so the devil tells him, go seek out Ghost Rider. He's the only one who can kill you. So, uh, Suicide is kind of a lame character. He will only be seen one other time after this and then be entirely forgotten. And basically, uh, Ghost Rider is hunting down Zodiac. He's tired of Zodiac. He's trying to take him out. And... Um, and defeat him and so while he's trying to take out Zodiac suicide shows up him and Ghost Rider fight uh, and then Zod uh, suicide helps Ghost Rider take out Zodiac Zodiac ends up dying uh, falling on a being impaled on some stuff on a garbage scow uh, suicide's the one that really does that to him not Ghost Rider because Ghost Rider refuses to kill him 
and then they burn his body and that's the end of Zodiac and to me that was a misstep I liked Zodiac Zodiac made an impression with me um, he was one of my favorites he's still one of my favorites from the Ghost Rider series as far as villains go he was pretty cool I liked him however he he ended up dying so the next issue is Snowblind again and this time Ghost Rider uh, takes out Snowblind and basically beats the hell out of him. However, we're introduced to a very important character uh, who would play a significant role down the line, and that is Lieutenant Michael Baldino. He's a cop with the New York Police Department. He's on a special task force, and their goal is to take down the Ghost Rider. And uh, think Punisher Light. He lead, he's basically no mercy, no nothing. He's all business and just just basically that's how he is and in the end after Ghost Rider beats up Snowblind Baldino uh, and his and his task force arrive and Snowblind's there and he's like ah, if you help me out I'll, I'll tell you where Ghost Rider's going and Baldino's like ah, no thanks and he shoots the hell out of Snowblind doesn't kill him but uh, really really it's pretty bad and so we're introduced to Michael Baldino issue 22 23 and 24 are all about taking down Death Watch. Death Watch uh, has two new flunkies, Hag and Troll. They kind of have a, um, a few powers like Hag can like enchant men and then she rips out their heart and Troll has like these arms that can turn into technicals and, and stun people and stuff like that. They're not that very good, and they're not really that important. They don't show up much after this, but basically Death Watch is uh, uh, using his business, and he's a big CEO of a company, and they basically kidnap people, like mostly homeless, and feed off the life forces of those people. And then, of course, he's got a training arena for his little ninjas in there to, you know, the little kill squad and stuff like that. And Death Watch kind of um, is playing things behind the scenes, and Ghost Rider eventually decides to try to stop him. Well, in the end, it takes three issues to do it, <laughs> but in the end, Ghost Rider decides he's going to break his vow, and he kills Death Watch. He impels him through the heart with his chain, and then Death Watch kind of like explodes, and Death Watch's last words are like, you know, he thought Ghost Rider might be Zarathos too. Um, and he's like, who the hell are you? And then he explodes. And that ends the first two years of Ghost Rider. A bunch of storylines are wrapped up. Zodiac is dead. Death Watch is dead. Blackout is in a mental institution. Captured. Hobgoblin's been captured. Uh, Zodiac, I mean Snowblind, is in the hospital. Uh, under police guard uh, awaiting to go to jail and um, a lot of the storylines have been settled a nice neat two-year wrap-up and that leaves us with the last the graphic novel it, it's kind of like a transition between uh, the two it happened around this time it came out around this time and it's a nice transition between the first year run the first two years and the next what's going on is basically introduces Blackheart who was the villain in the first Ghost Rider movie and Blackheart would be uh, a prominent figure in the Marvel Universe from now on uh, strange to think that basically he's a poor man's Mephisto uh, would become such a big figure in the Marvel Universe but hey well anyways Blackheart's whole deal is he hates his father Mephisto wants him dead uh, wants to use heroes to kill his father and he tries to recruit Ghost Rider, Wolverine, and the Punisher uh, to his cause. He tells Ghost Rider he can tell him his true identity. He tells Wolverine I can help you get your memories back and tell you where you got the adamantium from. Uh, you know at this time Wolverine's origin was unknown to him as well. And he tells the Punisher he can help him with his crusade on crime of course, all three resist him, and um, 
all three team up to take down Blackheart, which they do in the end. Um, but it's a very good book, and it's a it's a pretty damn good graphic novel, and it shows the relationship between Ghost Rider, Wolverine, and the Punisher, which they're going to kind of have a relationship quite often in the future. And it also introduces another motorcycle. It's basically, Ghost Rider has to you get another motorcycle and um, use it because Blackheart is using his. Of course, at the end of it, Ghost Rider gets his motorcycle back, but he has a spare one, which will become important later on down the line. But that is the first two years of Ghost Rider. And it is, like I said, arguably the greatest two-year run in any comic uh, for Ghost Rider. It's probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite run on Ghost Rider of all time. Howard Mackey is almost flawless with his storytelling. You care about the characters. There are a lot of good things. He slips every now and then, like suicide and stuff like that. Um, and the Morlocks. Uh, the art is fantastic. And the mystery into who Ghost Rider is is nail-biting. You, I literally, month from month, could not wait for the next issue of Ghost Rider to come out to see if they were going to finally reveal the mystery of who the Ghost Rider really was. It was a great time, and it was a great book, and that is why it did so well. So I highly recommend, if you don't know anything about Ghost Rider and you want to get into Ghost Rider, get the final run from Stern and Mattis in the first series, and then pick up this first two-year run of Howard Mackey. You will, you'll love every minute of it. It is so fantastic. But things can always be rosy forever. No. The end is coming for Ghost Rider, um, although it would take a while, but next kind of starts what would be a declining era for Ghost Rider, but first it would be propped up a little bit more from its success. So we'll cover that in the next video, but I hope you enjoyed this one, and until then, have fun.